Hello and welcome to Decision NYC with Ben Max. I'm Ben Max, your host and the executive editor of Gotham Gazette. The 2022 New York state elections are upon us with the party primaries coming up in June and the general election this fall. On the ballot this year are the statewide offices of governor, lieutenant governor, attorney general and controller, as well as one of the state's two US Senate seats and every seat in the state Senate, state assembly and New York delegation to the House of Representatives. It's an immensely important year for choosing the next roster of state government here in New York, as well as many federal office holders. This state election cycle would be of enormous importance even under more usual circumstances, but it's unfolding at a time of ongoing crisis and uncertainty due to the COVID-19 pandemic and its many effects, raising the stakes of the decisions that you, the voter, will make. This next wave of state leadership will make or break New York's recovery from the devastation of the pandemic and its impacts on health, families, jobs, housing, education, and much more. And as you get ready to make your choices in this year's elections, we're pleased to bring you a series of interviews with candidates running for the statewide offices, as well as interviews with other candidates in other races and a series of debates. These one-on-one -on -one conversations will help you to get to know the candidates better, learn about their backgrounds and platforms, where they stand on key issues, and what their vision is for the future of New York. We hope this and other interviews will help you sort through your many choices and make an informed decision when it's time to vote in the party primaries in June and the general election in the fall. Today, we're focused on the position of governor, the state's chief executive responsible for running much of state government, implementing and enforcing laws, signing or vetoing legislation passed by the state legislature, working with those legislators to pass a state budget, working with counties, cities, and towns to provide funding and services, and much more. So joining me now by Zoom is Rob Astorino, a Republican candidate for governor of New York. Mr. Astorino was a two-term Westchester County executive and the 2014 Republican nominee for governor of New York. He currently works as a business and media consultant. Rob, thanks so much for joining me. Welcome. Thanks, Ben. Good to be with you. Thanks for taking the time. So let's get right to it. We'll get into a lot of specifics about what you're promising to do if you're elected governor, why you should win the Republican primary and then the general election and so forth. But just give people sort of a, a two minute snapshot of, of who you are, your values, your background, what you want them to know about you uh, as a leader, as a person and why you're running for governor. Well, first and foremost, I'm a New Yorker through and through, runs through my veins. I worked in New York City uh, most of my professional life. I live in Westchester. Um, my wife and I have three kids. One just started college. Uh, one is in high school and one is in middle school. So we're, you know, right in the thick of things as parents and watching what's going on around us and uh, not liking the, uh, the craziness, if you will. So uh, professionally, I've always been in TV and radio for the most part. I, I kind of consider myself, um, you know, a, not so much a journalist as a, as a broadcaster and talk radio and TV, both behind the scenes and management and executive roles and on the air. Um, and so I, you know, got elected in Westchester in 2009 against all odds because some people don't realize outside of New York City, Westchester is one of the deepest blue counties in New York. Trump lost it by 37 points. So it's rough terrain for elephants, but yet uh, I won and big in 2009 for the same kind of reasons I'm running here in New York because things are really out of balance. People can't afford it. And, and it was the same message then and I won, got reelected and uh, it's why I'm running for governor. So, you know, I consider myself a New Yorker, certainly a family guy. My wife and I, um, her parents are from Ireland. So, uh, you know, they immigrated over here. My family goes back, you know, to Italy coming here a long time ago. Uh, and so it's kind of the melting pot. And, um, you know, I just I love New York. I love so much about it. I just don't like where it is right now or where it's going. So that's why I'm I've jumped in the race. And we'll, and we'll get to, to all that in just a second. In terms of your public service record, what can you tell voters is one or two things that you're most proud of that you accomplished uh, as Westchester County Executive or, or in any other venue that uh, you feel best exemplifies your, your public service record? I've done a lot of public service. Most of it was part time. I started when I was young on my school board in my town. So I you know, was deeply involved in education issues and public education. I am a big proponent of uh, 
parental choice, which is not taken away from public education. My wife is a public education teacher, special education. So I believe very strongly in that I'm the product of, of public education. I went to a Catholic college. Uh, my son went to a Catholic high school, but before that public education, my daughters are in our local school district. So I believe very much in it, but I also believe that we need choice options. And, um, and I think I've been consistent with that. So I do believe in charters. I do believe in parochial schools. And I do think that we can have all of them and, and still excel at all of them. Um, I, so I serve locally, uh, my town board as well. And then when I got elected county executive in 09, one of the biggest reasons I ran then is that, you know, taxes were out of control. Everything was kind of completely uh, out of whack, sort of like what we're dealing with now. And, you know, my message was clear, you know, stop the tax madness. Let's get some balance. And, uh, and I had a lot of Democratic support. Uh, I had a lot of support from Hispanics and African Americans and, and the coalitions that I was able to build, including governing in a Democratic county with a Democratic uh, legislature the entire time. And yet we were able to get things done. And I was very proud of that. So it's the same kind of thing right now. You know, the city is uh, very far to the left right now. The state is very far to the left right now. The one party rule, I think, has brought some disastrous results, whether it's crime, whether it's cost of living and quality of life, when, whether it's energy issues. So all of these things are chasing away what I would call normal people, you know, just the average New Yorker who can't afford it anymore. And they're they're fleeing. And, and that's no good because our businesses are closing, especially during covid uh, and they're just relocating as well as just typical families. And, you know, that that has to stop. So that's why I'm running. I think balance is good. I think, you know, um, coalitions are good, even though, you know, I, I stand firmly as a Republican. But I realize this is a very blue state and we're going to have to compromise on things. And so there's no, you know, there's no shame in that. But we've got to move forward. We've got to turn the ship around because the direction we're going in is disastrous. I'm glad you mentioned that and also your experience in Westchester working with the Democratic legislature. Maybe we'll get back to this in a few minutes because the, you know, the odds are if a Republican is successful in the in the gubernatorial race this year, you're still likely working with uh, Democratic majorities in both houses of the legislature, although there's you know obviously some Republican hopes for regaining some seats, especially in the state Senate. But we, we can come back to that in a second. Give us the, the top planks of your platform. You, you've kind of gotten at it a little bit here, but what are you promising New York voters that you would do if elected governor? Uh, what are the two, three most important things? I know when you're governor of New York State, you have to deal with a dozen plus things, you know, dozens of things. But when you're when you're running this year in this election, what's at the top of the list? I know it can change depending on where you are in the state, who you're talking with, what's most important to them. But what do you put at the top of the list in terms of the broadest promises you're making to voters this year? I think a dozen things an hour. <laughs> and, and I dealt with that as county executive in Westchester, which, you know, it's a million people. It's a very important county, uh, you know, for the economy in New York, but also politically. And, you know, I had to deal with that. And I had to deal with every every group or every person coming in with a well-intentioned idea, but usually expensive. And we were maxed out. And so, I promised when I got into office, I ran on it, that I was not going to raise taxes. We were going to have to live within our means and prioritize within the budget. I walked in, it was a $1.8 billion budget with a $165 million deficit. We got rid of the deficit. We never once raised taxes. In fact, we cut them. And we left eight years later with the same $1.8 billion budget. That was a lot of hard work that was prioritizing. Again, that was working with the Democratic legislature who agreed with me. On, on the big stuff. Uh, and we were successful. And, and we, we really revitalized the private sector, kept some very big corporations in Westchester, like PepsiCo and MasterCard, Regeneron, which was in the news the last several years with COVID, uh, built enormously in, in Westchester. So um, I think we had eight good, good years. New York right now is completely out of whack. I mean, they have added billions and billions and billions of dollars, 178 billion to 212 billion in one year in our budget. And they're fighting over billions more to add to it. That means, you know, New Yorkers are going to get taxed as soon as this election is over because they're going to say you're not paying your fair share. 
Um, and so they're, they're spending us into oblivion. And that really does matter because in the end, it's always the middle class who pays and can't afford it and, and ends up leaving or suffering. So I, I, what's my top priority, Ben? Well, it's pretty simple. The economy has to be put back on track in New York. People have lost their jobs. Uh, the inflation is really eating into their income or into their savings. I mean, it's like you got to go to the bank to take a mortgage out just to go fill up your car. And that shouldn't be. Same thing when you go to the supermarket. So the, people are hurting and they're not being heard. And, and that's a big issue. People are just not being heard. And, and I will hear them. And I feel it, too. So I think the economy is number one. Um, and, and number two is crime as well. And maybe it's one, one A. You can't have a growing economy if people feel unsafe, if they don't feel like going into work. They don't feel like going into the city, especially from the suburbs, too. That's a large amount of money that comes into New York City, uh, whether it's Broadway, the restaurants, the, you know, the Ranger games, you name it. And that is a very big issue. There's no cash bail stuff. Uh, all of a sudden, Kathy Hoko has seen the light. What she saw was the polls, because that was her big champion uh, legislation. She and Andrew Cuomo, they signed that bill. They championed it. And now all of a sudden... Uh, whoa, 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 maybe we've got to make some changes. Well, that wasn't the case recently. She stood by it, and many are standing by it, and I won't. Uh, we will get rid of that. We will toughen up crime. We'll support the NYPD and our police officers. People don't feel safe, and if they're not safe, you cannot have a vibrant city or state. So both of those issues, I think, go hand in hand. Also, energy issues in this state, uh, you know, some people on Fifth Avenue may not like it, but upstate, we are blessed with natural gas, and we've got to find ways to extract that safely, and it can be done. That will help not only you at the United States become energy independent again. Right now, we're begging Saudi Arabia and, and rogue nations like Iran and Venezuela to pump more oil when we have our, our natural resources here in our state. So, you know, whether it's nuclear power, like Indian Point, they shut down, that's 25% of our New York City region energy, natural gas and pipelines. We've got to have a balance. And that's what I will do. I was proud to have the New York League of Conservation Voters endorsements when I was Westchester County Executive because we found a balance. Mm -hmm. We're out of balance. It, it's so far over right now. And that's missing from Albany. Just very quickly, would you would you look to re-engage um, the Indian Point nuclear plant? Would you would you look to bring that back uh, online if you were governor? I would, and yeah. I think it's necessary for for our our climate goals, but also our our energy needs. And by the way, I sued Andrew Cuomo and the state to keep Indian Point open, but more than that to follow the environmental laws that they completely threw aside, and that set a very bad precedent. Because if the state was allowed to do that, and by the way, there was, there was no even whispers from some of the environmental groups who I begged to stand next to me and, and join me on this, they were dead silent on this, as were the Democrats in Westchester. That, not only the, the energy, but they could have said, all right, we want Indian Point closed, but we also think the process is important, including the State Environmental uh, Quality Review Act, which they completely poo-pooed and didn't do. And it has enormous consequences, the closure of Indian Point, not, on, not just on energy, but on jobs, on the economy, all of that, and mitigating factors. Where is that energy going to be replaced by? So I think the process is just as important as the closure was to some people, but I do believe it should be open. And on, on these issues of, of creating more energy, energy independence, you say safely extracting natural gas in New York, say a little bit more about how you would approach uh, these issues, these climate issues, the major, you know, sweeping climate leadership and community protection act passed in 2009 has a lot of implementation yeah. questions. We don't have time to get into all the nitty gritty, but how would you approach this sort of this transition? Uh, you say, bring, bring Indian point back on. So there's a couple principles. Are there other things in this realm that you'd be looking because climate is obviously about the climate. It's about impacts of you know severe weather, but we're also talking about New York as part of the world ecosystem uh, on all these issues. And so much of this is about the New York economy and the connections between the climate, the environment, and the economy. How would you approach these issues beyond a couple of things you've already said? And I think you could have them together. And they are. They're not separate. The economy and the environment should go hand in hand. You can have that balance 
Right now, we don't have a balance. So they're willing to crush the economy, cost jobs, cost people, raise taxes in order to get something that is so far over. Uh, and, and I think we need to have sort of the all of the above. I, I'm totally in favor of renewable energy. I think it's great. And I go upstate and I do see windmills. And, and obviously, um, you, we can and should be doing that in solar. However, we're never going to get from here to there in a eight short years with massive expenses and costs to consumers without bridging that gap. And, and it's not going to be in eight years. That's not even realistic. So we, we let's not pretend that it is. But we do have to have a long range plan. And part of that should be natural gas. They're doing it in Pennsylvania, literally right across the border from our own counties. And we've got people going to Pennsylvania where they're benefiting. We need to benefit from that as well. And by the way, we need the natural gas. So again, all the above approach, I think, is rational. It is necessary, and it can bring a lot of benefits to us as a state. And is there anything in terms of how the state is moving forward on these issues that you would look to really pull back on other than things like the decommissioning of the nuclear plants? Or is, is as you said, all of the above means let's go forward with the transmission lines from Canada and upstate that are in the works. Let's go forward with all the wind farms. Let's go forward with the solar but also add in the natural gas and the nuclear. Is that is yeah. that a fair way to? Yeah, I mean, look, I want to assess a lot when I get in there. And, and I did that in Westchester. It's Sometimes it's hard because there's a lot of things that you're dealing with. But I will tell you this, um, we need energy in order to grow in this state. And to pretend that it's just going to be wind uh, or solar uh, is not going to get it done. And so we have to be not a third world country, which is what we will become if we get rid of some of our natural resources and don't use them, uh, meaning you know natural gas that we do have. Or look, I can't turn on Indian Point. That, that would take a private company coming back in and the state saying, okay, since the state harassed them and basically drove Entergy out, and I'm very familiar with it because it was in Westchester, and I was in charge, God forbid anything ever happened in evacuation plans, I dealt with Indian Point all the time. I was in the plant. It was the safest run plant in America, according to the NRC. So the fear mongering and, and the radicalism in Albany drove them out. But yet we need that. So I, I do believe very strongly uh, of an all of the above. In eight short years, people don't realize this. It is going to cost them an enormous amount of money. We're not going to have any gas-fired engines in cars being sold in New York, among many other issues that people aren't even aware of yet. This will You think it's expensive now for utility costs? Just you wait. Let me come back on the economy. Uh, obviously, New York City, uh, where we're based, is um, still struggling with very high unemployment mm -hmm. relative to pre-pandemic. So much of that is related to, to tourism, uh, yeah. you know, the sort of nightlife of the city and so much more, some of which is obviously returning as we talk here in mid to late March. But it, tourism, really, the tourism economy is nowhere near where it was. And there's obviously hopeful signs around that. A lot of that will depend on what happens around the world related to COVID and other things. Outside of New York City is, is seemingly where there's been this really long-term trend of economic uh, recession and, and real challenges with shrinking uh, areas around the state, population loss, and so forth more population growth in New York City, economic growth in New York City, et cetera. On the economy, is there a, a Rob Astorino sort of focus that you would have in terms of revitalizing some of the, the cities and other areas around the state that are outside of New York City? Governor Cuomo, we saw, had an agenda around this that mostly looks like it was unsuccessful. What would the Rob Astorino plan there be? Well, it was not only unsuccessful, and that was predictable, but it was corrupt. And I called it corrupt back in 2014 when I ran against him. The so-called Buffalo Billion was nothing more than a giveaway. So was the startup New York. All of that led to corruption, to indictments, to guilty guilty uh, verdicts, and people in prison. And um, And that is not the approach. Look, if you look around the country, the 10 worst states are all... A uh, very deep blue run by their executives or legislature that has a very heavy handed approach uh, that does all these kind of boondoggles instead of sort of letting it be played by 
the entrepreneurs by companies. Yes, you have to regulate. I'm never saying no, but the corporate taxes, the income taxes, all of those matter. That's why people are shifting in this country. And if you want to punch them and harass them and, and be the enemy of them, the opponent of them as government, they're going to leave. And they are. And let's, please don't tell me they're not. The proof is in the population loss. We lost another congressional seat. So we have to be real competitive. I've always said since 14 that we've got to be the most competitive state in the Northeast. And I think that competition is beatable. Connecticut, New Jersey, Massachusetts, all fairly high tax states, very heavily regulated states. Uh, let's, let's be number one in the Northeast. Let's let the air out of the balloon with regard to um, the, the red tape. Uh, the, the, again, the Albany and the New York City being the opponents of business. We lost 30% of our small businesses during COVID. The reason, Ben, that people aren't coming back right now with tourism um, who wants to go down in the subway and be shoved onto the tracks or be hit with a, a bag of feces or over the head with a hammer or shot and then have these thugs get right back out because of no cash bail? Yes, that has an, uh, an effect. We had folks, my, my wife's cousins came in from Ireland last week. They're like, I don't know if we want to go to the city. Maybe we'll just come up to Westchester. So, yeah, they know about that worldwide because it is real. And then when you have restrictions with COVID, you still have two-year-olds being masked right now. There's a sense of ridiculousness, and I don't need to be there, certainly not now. That means a lot of money not going to the pockets of our small businesses and our people in New York City uh, and throughout the state. So I think if you look at the macro picture, they will come because they went to other states. If they're invited in, if they're actually, um, you know, if government is saying to them, we actually want you here, and, and the tax rate has to be reduced in a measurable way. Otherwise, they're not coming. They're just not. On those economic issues, along with reducing red tape, along with reducing corporate taxes and other taxes, as you, as you say, do you not think that there will need to be significant state incentives, uh, uh, subsidies in order to attract uh, businesses to New York outside of, of New York City? Do you not think that that needs to be part of the picture as well? We have that already. Mm -hmm. We have that. They give away and, and billions in tax credits and everything else. You would you would keep some of that in place. Some, maybe some, I think we would get rid of. We'd have to look at that. But I, let me tell you, again, business is going to go where it makes sense for them. Mm -hmm. We are blessed upstate with land. We're blessed with a great agricultural um, you know, uh, sector. We are blessed potentially with energy and we're not using it. Uh, we're blessed with workers and colleges. But they don't see hope or a future in New York, so they leave. And so we've got population decline. And then you get to the suburbs, it's extraordinarily expensive. And then the city is just the city where it's gotten crazy and people don't necessarily want to be there. So again, you know, it sounds simple, yeah. but it hasn't been done. Let's I, go the other way. Let's spend less and let's tax less and watch what happens. Because we've seen what's happened in, in some of the Southern states where people and businesses are going. I need to follow up with you here because the, the examples you mentioned on, on around bail reform, those are violent offenses that are very much still eligible for bail. The data simply doesn't show a, a strong connection between bail That's reform. Incorrect. And I'll tell you why. Because they cherry pick those numbers. Those numbers don't account for the second and repeat offenses for one person. So mm -hmm. they are adding up. And in fact, when you cherry pick and just use the first offense, then it is lower. And they specifically use specific years and, and did not count repeat offenders. So when you do, it's in the 40s of the repeat. So that is measurable and that is, that is real. So it's that, but it's not just that, Ben. It's not just the no cash bail. It was the whole defund the, the police movement. It was the antagonistic against law enforcement. It's people like Alvin Bragg, who the new district attorney says, well, I don't like laws that, you know, I'm not going to prosecute and we're going to let them out. It's judges who say, you know what, I feel bad, let them out. Let, All let, of these things me... matter. It's deploying the NYPD in a specific way or, or telling them to stand down while there are riots. All so of those let, things let, matter. Let, let, tell us what your bail proposal is. That's, that's I do. what I'm getting. What, what would you change? about the bail law. Uh, Certainly you know. discretion to judges for dangerousness. I, I think that's very important. That's happened around the country. We're the only state that says no to giving some judge, giving judges that kind of discretion. 
Um, you know, also uh, the prosecutors right now, they're getting inundated with the um, part of the no cash bail law that was discovery. So all of a sudden witnesses don't feel safe. Uh, the victim doesn't feel safe because all their personal information has to be given to the defense right away. And, and there's certain timeframes which are really condensed. So the district attorney's offices can't get all this information or the police departments can't get all this information quickly, which means cases are dropped. Same thing with guns. We go off about uh, you know the people who actually are, are good citizens of our state who pass criminal background checks, never committed a crime, and their rights are being taken away under the Second Amendment, yet the criminals, the gangbangers, the drug dealers, all caught with illegal guns, and yet the straw men or those gun possession are being dropped. It's completely yeah, there, reversed. In there's how a, lot of, a, lot of, um, a lot of question and debate over the, the sort of simple gun possession charges um, and how those have been handled. Well, uh, illegal gun, an illegal gun in a, in a crime, it, it really shouldn't be a, a debatable prosecute, and they're not. You're in a Republican primary. Uh, yeah. There's four major candidates. Um, in our last couple minutes here, I want uh, you to help voters understand how you differentiate yourself from those other major candidates, Lee Zeldin, Harry Wilson, Andrew Giuliani. What makes you different from, from them? And and sort of in that, describing for people sort of what kind of New York Republican you are, because it's very different to win a primary and then have a chance to really win in the general election in New York. And New York Republicans have really sort of struggled to figure out that brew. I think the big thing that separates me is I got elected in a chief executive role in a very large county that we have to, being a statewide Republican, either win or be competitive in, and no other Republican has been able to do that in 25 years. They just get slaughtered in Westchester. And yet I can win it or I can be competitive. And that means that state is in play and we can win statewide. I speak Spanish and um, you know that in and of itself has been very helpful in, in outreach. Uh, I've always overperformed. I won the Hispanic vote outright in Westchester in my elections. We won 25% of the African-American vote. Uh, and 20, over 20% of the Democratic vote. So I have done electorally in a chief elected role, chief executive elected role, uh, what we need to do in New York State to be competitive. So um, that in my, my experience as an executive and, and actually doing what others say they might do, I actually did it. You know, We actually cut taxes, we held firm on the budget and prioritized. I worked with the Democratic legislature we got things done. We revitalized the private sector. We kept crime low. You know, energy issues, environmental issues I dealt with, and I think we have a very good record on. So uh, I think that separates me. And I think this election is going to go through not so much New York City. I think it's going to be important. But honestly, I think, and most people think, it's going to be the suburbs this year. And I do think this is going to be the revenge of the normal people. I think just normal New Yorkers of all stripes are going to be like, enough, man. I can't, I can't deal with this craziness anymore. I need some balance. And one party rule has been very destructive in New York and very costly. So that's why I'm running. That's why I'm the most electable. And, 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 and a lot of that is, is related to the general election. And as I said, uh, yep. the Republican calculus, which, which we wrote about this at Gotham Gazette, you know, the, the sort of undercurrent of your Republican state convention was about this question of who could actually win in, in the general election. But that's not what wins in the primary necessarily, uh, even mm -hmm. though you're trying to make that case. Is there more of a message to Republican primary voters that you want to deliver in terms of where the party in New York state needs to be and needs to go in order to have a chance to win statewide in a general election and understanding that in a primary. Look, I've been a Republican all my life and I've gotten elected uh, as a strong Republican and conservative. And, you know, my primary opponent, I would say, uh, Lee Zeldin, uh, I think most think it's going to be really tough for him to win statewide. And I, I would say for me in a primary, his Achilles heels is going to be his record in Albany. He was in Albany. He had a chance in Albany and he blew it. He was a reliable vote for Andrew Cuomo and voted for that agenda. And I don't see how uh, you can make the case when you're arguing against Kathy Hochul or whomever, when they're going to say, wait a minute, you voted for the Democratic budgets. You voted for Andrew Cuomo, uh, it, it, you know, with his agenda. 
and then and then claim things are are wrong. You know, he kept us on this track that we're on. Things could have been enormously different. And in 14, when I ran against Cuomo, I called Cuomo corrupt to his face when unfortunately Lee Zeldin and many others in the state Senate Republicans were too quiet. Interesting. Those are obviously uh, a reference at times to some of the deals uh, crafted yeah. between Andrew Cuomo, Republican State Senate, Democratic Assembly, a lot more to get to there, but we have to wrap up. Rob Astorino, uh, a candidate for governor of New York State in the Republican primary. Thank you very much for, for all the time. Anytime, Ben. Thank you very much. And thank you for watching Decision NYC with Ben Max. Key decisions for New York State are coming up in the June primaries and the fall general election. There's a lot on the line for all of us and the future of New York City and New York State. I hope this conversation is helpful to you as you make your decisions when it's time to vote. I'm Ben Max. See you next time.